Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> we're back into chapter 19, and here we're not talking about um, corporate formation, but we are talking about reorganization. Really, mergers and acquisitions is what this is about. And then on top of mergers and acquisitions, we're going to talk about liquidation. And so the book sets up this matrix, acquisition matrix, I guess is what you could call it. Um, and so on the left-hand side, you have the type of transaction this is, um, whether it's taxable or non-taxable. And then at the top, you have the types of consideration you can use. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be all one or the other. It can be a combination of assets or stock. But for ease of learning this, uh, you know, this is basic 101 mergers and acquisitions. So kind of helps to compartmentalize some of this stuff, at least for right now. But in theory, you could use a combination of assets and stock, cash and stock, very, very common. And so when negotiating an acquisition, management has to consider the, the type of assets or, or stock they want to use, either all or in combination thereof, and they have to determine um, whether they want it to be taxable or non-taxable. Taxable has some advantages, has some disadvantages, same for non-taxable. So we'll talk about those. One of the main advantages of, again, going back to this matrix, Right here, the taxable uh, purchase of assets, and here they're using the example in the book. I think the acquiring company is SCR, and the <coughs> acquired company, the target company, is WCR. And so, with that in mind, SCR is looking to see whether or not they want to purchase the assets or purchase the stock from the sole shareholder of WCR or whether or not they want to do a non-taxable reorganization, either a Type A or a Type B. In a Type A, uh, you're using assets. In Type B, you're using stock of SCR. Well, in type, type A, you're acquiring the assets of WCR in return for SCR equity. All right, so again, um, in looking at this matrix, and I'll probably refer back to this quite a bit, uh, purchasing assets from WCR with any type of consideration is uh, the advantage of this, even though it's taxable, that's certainly a disadvantage. The advantage is that the buyer gets to step up their basis in the property they acquire to fair market value. And in corporate acquisitions, a big part of the fair market value or the value in a, an acquired corporation is in things that are not tangible, such as customer lists, reputation, um, the value of the workforce and things like that. And so a big part of um, what occurs in an acquisition, a big part of the difference between um, the fair market value of the tangible assets and the purchase price are these intangibles. And so these intangibles show up in um, this thing called purchase goodwill. And purchase goodwill can be 
Uh, so you've got two things going on. The, the tangible assets, as well as other intangibles, such as copyrights, patents, things like that, can be stepped up in their basis, and uh, you use that step-up amount value as your basis for determining depreciation going forward if they are de a depreciable asset. Okay? So that's, that's a good thing because uh, depreciation expense reduces uh, taxable income, which reduces taxes. And then you've got this purchase goodwill that you, for tax purposes, can uh, amortize over a 15-year period. And that can be a pretty sizable amount of any acquisition, as I said. So um, that may be a factor, a big factor for a company to want this to be a taxable um, asset acquisition. Well, what's the downside of that? Well, the downside is, um, as they talk about in the book, is that the seller has to also recognize gain, the difference between the va uh, value of the assets sold and its basis. And then on top of that, you've got your shareholders of the target corporation who are going to receive proceeds and the proceeds received they're going to have to recognize uh, uh, usually as a capital gain the difference between the proceeds received from the target corporation and their basis in the tor target corporation's stock so you know, it, bottom line is you've got this adversity of interests. You've got this on the, the acquiring corporation side, you've got one set of interests and then you've got a competing set of interests uh, in the target corporation and its shareholders. Sometimes um, the, the chasm is so wide that the parties can't come to an agreement on a deal but I mean you know if the buyer pays them enough they'll they'll accept it but still you've got competing interests going on here now Stock acquisitions and tax deferred assets acquisition, the, the tax basis of the target corporation's assets remain at their carryover basis. So this is not a good thing. This is not a desirable thing for the uh, acquiring company, but it, it may be the only way that they can get the target company to agree to uh, be acquired by the acquiring company. All right, so let's talk about the taxable acquisitions. And so that would be um, in looking at the matrix. Um, Assets purchased from the target company um, or the acquiring company uh, buying the stock of the target company's shareholders. And so cash purchases of stock 
or common for public firms, but that may be true of private firms as well if they have the money to do so without acquiring extra debt. Cash has non-tax advantages. One of the main advantages of the acquiring company purchasing the stock of the target company shareholders is that they don't become owners in the acquiring company. If all you're doing is giving the uh, shareholders of the target company, you're asking them to surrender shares in the, in the target company in return for shares in the um, acquiring company, what you're basically doing is increasing the number of shares in the acquiring company. And what that does is it makes your return on equity, uh, it makes that number go down. In other words, you have to earn more because to get the same return on equity because you've got more shareholders involved. If you just buy them out with cash and don't make them part of the equation in return on equity by giving them shares of the target company, or excuse me, the acquiring company, no problem. Now, note that a stock acquisition for cash results in the acquired company retaining its tax and legal identity, although it will be as a subsidiary of the acquiring company. The good thing about this is also from a non-tax standpoint, <clears throat> notice that it's now a subsidiary, and this, this occurs with other types of acquisitions as well that we'll talk about, um, mainly the type A uh, reorganizations. Um, you're, you're setting up, you're acquiring this company, but you're not merging it into the acquiring corporation, the target becomes a subsidiary of the acquiring corporation. It keeps its identity. If you have any contingent liabilities in the target company, well, it's its own separate uh, organization. And so the parent doesn't come uh, become responsible for any contingent liabilities of the sub. And, you know, you'll see this. Sometimes subsidiaries will go bankrupt and the parent remains intact. <clears throat> now, Let's go back to taxable acquisitions. And if you look at the little matrix again, you can use any consideration. If it's an asset purchase from, in this case, WCR, uh, the acquiring company gets a step up in basis in the assets of WCR. That's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> the shareholders, or in this case, shareholder <coughs> of the target company does not become a shareholder of the acquiring corporation. Uh, if it's a stock purchase, and, and of course, um, the acquired company becomes a subsidiary of uh, the acquiring company, of course, they could just liquidate that and merge it into the acquiring company as well. And so a stock acquisition for cash results in the 
uh, acquired company retaining its tax liability. We already mentioned that. The acquiring company can either keep this as a subsidiary or they can liquidate the acquired company into the parent itself. But again, if you have contingent liabilities that, that you think are in the target company, you probably want to just keep this as a, an existing subsidiary. That's my point. Now, if, if all you're doing is purchasing shares from the target company shareholders, um, you're going to have a situation where it's not taxable to the target corporation because the basis in the underlying assets of the target corporation just carry over into the into them as a subsidiary of the uh, acquiring corporation. Where it's taxable is to the shareholders of the target corporation. And so their gain recognized is the difference between uh, proceeds realized and the basis in their stock of the target corporation. All right, so let's talk about they say cells, I guess I say matrix, they say cells. So I'll keep saying matrix, but it's for the book purpose, it's cell three and four. And so cell three is these various types of type A reorganizations. And then cell four is a type B reorganization. Now, understand this. Some of these are not acquisitions under A. I mean, you could have a reorganization uh, that is not uh, where you have an acquisition, okay? And that's some of these other, if you look at page, um, way on down the line, page, uh, well, it's exhibit 19-12, summary of tax deferred corporate reorganizations. When you get down to some of these uh, types, type C through type, F, uh, type G, uh, there's no acquisition involved there. It's just simply a reorganization of a corporation. They're not acquiring another company. They're just reorganizing themselves and maybe some of their subsidiaries. So understand that this tax deferred stuff does not uh, exclusively deal with acquisitions. It ex it much, it's much broader than that. But this is M&A 101, Mergers and Acquisitions 101. So we're simply hitting the, the various type A acquisitions and type B acquisition. We're not going to go C through G. It's just too much. I'm trying to get you the basics. And so, just like how, how we saw in forming a corporation, some of the same concepts are involved here. It allows taxpayers to organize a corporation in a tax-deferred manner. And um, this can be in the form of an acquisition. This can be uh, in the form of those other types of uh, reorganizations which allow uh, 
the corporation to, to reorganize their tax structure in a tax deferred manner. Now, in order for a particular plan, whether it be an acquisition or a reorganization of a corporation, all of the all or some of the following judicial principles must be present in the the transaction, if you will. And right now, I just want you to get to know the concepts, and then as we go through the various type A reorganizations and the, the type B reorganization, we'll talk about which of these specific principles must be met in the various types of acquisitions. Okay, so the first principle, and notice it's judicial principles. This is an area where there's not a lot of guidance um, from Congress or in the Internal Revenue Code. It's pretty vague. And so the IRS has tried to set up regulations involving uh, this, but as often happens, it really gets down to judicial interpretation of the law to determine what principles are involved. And so the first is called the continuity of interest principle. And this just simply says that shareholders of the acquired corporation should retain a continuing ownership interest in the target. Okay. Get back to my page. And so here, um, I mean, that doesn't really tell us a whole lot. So how much continuing ownership must the shareholders of the Target Corporation retain? Well, um, it, it doesn't give a whole lot of well, the IRS doesn't give a whole lot of guidance here except one example uh, in the regulations in which it states that a, a continuity of interest is satisfied when the shareholders of the target corporation in the aggregate receive equity equal to 40% or more of the total value of consideration received. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that there can be a combination of stock in the acquiring company and other property, usually cash, paid to the shareholders of the target company. And the only caveat is that of that totality of other property and stock in the acquiring corporation to the target shareholders, they must receive at least 40% in equity. And so they have an example in the book uh, on page 26, Disney to acquire Marvel entertainment note that uh, in this case they made it such that uh, cash would not exceed uh, 60 percent or put another way that equity would not be less than 40 percent the next principle is called continuity of business interest And what this means is that the target corporation's historical 
uh, business must continue or at least a significant portion of the target corporation's historic business assets must be retained. Well, what, what's significant? Um, well, this is another murky area and it's all based on, based on facts and circumstances of the situation. Um, is it significant if I use 51% of the assets of the target corporation going forward? I don't know. It's a majority, 51%. Might not be enough for a court, but that along with other evidence might be enough. Who knows? Business purpose test. This gets back to an old case called Gregory versus Helvering. Um, Gregory is the plaintiff, the, the party suing, and at least back then, um, the named defendant would not be the IRS, it would be the commissioner. And so in this case, Helvering is the commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service. And so that's a pretty landmark case. And what this bought, brought forth is this idea of the concept of substance over form. And so, if there is no business or corporate pur purpose for the transaction, then uh, the transaction should not be tax de deferred. And so, to meet the business purpose test, the acquiring corporation must be able to show a significant non-tax avoidance purpose for engaging in the transaction. What might that be? No clue. It, it varies from case to case. Again, it's a facts and circumstances type of situation. So, you know, just take it for what it is and, you know, I'm not not trying to teach you to be lawyers, obviously, but I mean, let's face it, um, when you're dealing with tax law, you're dealing with part of the law, right? So you've got to know some of these concepts. All right, now we get to some uh, non-taxable acquisitions. And again, when we say non-taxable, it may be non-taxable in whole or simply in part. All right, so type A asset acquisitions. There's, there's actually your, your basic type A reorganization or acquisition, and then there's some uh, variations of. In your classic, Type A asset acquisition. This would be in um, what they call variant or um, cell three. Here you're using all or a part of. the acquiring corporation's stock. And so one corporation acquires the assets and liabilities of another corporation in return for stock of the acquiring corporation, or as I said, it can be a combination of stock and cash. 
and and again some of these other principles we just talked about may be involved so uh, that determines how much of the mix of stock and cash you can you can have the acquisition is tax deferred if the transaction satisfies the continuity of interest continuity of business and business purpose requirements you must also meet state law requirements in order for it to be a valid merger or consolidation. And so, before we get to this, I mean, if you look at uh, Exhibit 19-8, there is what I would call your classic version of a Type A merger and again, referring to Exhibit 19-8, you've got the Acquiring Corporation, SCR, um, giving stock and cash to WCR, the target, in return for the assets and liabilities of WCR. And so, WCR is merging into SCR. It's not a separate company set up as a subsidiary. As far as the sole shareholder, Pam, of WCR, she returns her WCR stock in return for SCR stock and possibly cash. WCR does not recognize a gain or a loss. Its basis in its assets simply uh, carry over to SCR. SCR, by the way, recognizes no gain or loss. Neither does the target shareholder, Pam. So, in this, or at least, uh, well, in this case, if she receives cash, uh, she will recognize gain on the receipt of cash. So it's, you know, it's like, it's like um, we saw with 351 corporate formations. It was non-taxable except to the extent of boot received. Well, same here. Um, and so it's taxable to the extent of boot received by shareholder Pam, okay? So note here, in, in this type of merger, your classic, what I would call your classic type A merger, what happens when the smoke clears? Well, what you have left is WCR assets being absorbed into SCR, WCR goes away. It no longer exists. Its assets exist in SCR. Pam is no longer a shareholder of WCR because WCR no longer exists. She's a shareholder of SCR. Now, again, as, as I talked earlier, you might have a situation where um, you might not want to absorb the target company into the acquiring company. For instance, where you have a situation where there's some uh, lawsuits out there, contingent liabilities or whatever, maybe some uh, warranty claims or potential warranty claims against the target company. In this case, what you would want to do is possibly set up a subsidiary and so uh, most common what companies do is they set up what's called an acquisition subsidiary. <clears throat> and so if you look at e Exhibit 19-9, you have an example of a forward triangular merger where the uh, acquiring corporation sets up a, an acquisition subsidiary The target transfers substantially 
all of their properties to the acquisition subsidiary, what the target corporation does when they're setting up this acquisition subsidiary is they transfer uh, the parent SCR's stock to the acquisition subsidiary and what the shareholder of WCR, the target company, does is she uh, gives her stock to the acquisition subsidiary in return for uh, SCR stock that the acquisition subsidiary gives her. So when the smoke clears, what you have is WCR's uh, assets uh, set up in this new subsidiary. And again, subsidiaries are a separate corporation for, ta uh, for uh, legal purposes. So, you know, if some of these contingent liabilities arise into real liabilities later and they have to file bankruptcy, they can, they can do so without it affecting the, the parent corporation. Uh, as far as the, the sole shareholder of WCR, she now becomes a uh, shareholder of SCR. Now note some uh, caveats here. As long as you do it this way, this is a tax deferred uh, deal as long as you meet the requirements of being a type A merger. And so the acquiring corporation must use solely the stock of its parent and acquire substantially all of the target corporation's property in the transaction. Again, what, what does substantially all mean? I don't know. I would say 80% or more. Let's see. Oh, 90% or more. Um, it says the IRS interprets substantially all to mean 90% or more. The fair market value of the target's net properties and 70% of the fair market value of gross properties. So I guess the difference between net properties and gross properties, maybe the, the debt involved. Gross properties is without the debt, net, net is with the debt. I guess that's what that means. And so the target corporation uh, merges into an 80% or more owned acquisition subsidiary of the acquiring corporation. Um, and again, this kind of repeat acquisition subsidiary must acquire substantially all the target. Yeah, we already said that. All right. So that's what this looks like. Now, um, you may have a situation where the target company has a really good reputation and you want to keep the name and the reputation going after the acquisition. And so let's say if you look at... Uh, Exhibit 19-10. What you have here is a type A reverse triangular merger and what happens is after the smoke clears the acquisition subsidiary of SCR merges into WCR and WCR remains or becomes a subsidiary of SCR and keeps its name and assets and all that stuff and reputation. And then the, the shareholder of WCR, the target corporation, receives stock in exchange for her returning at least 
80% of the stock of the target corporation. Note that the one requirement is that the uh, stock received by the target corporation shareholder or shareholders must be uh, voting stock. So it can't, it can be preferred or common, but it's got to be voting stock. Some other requirements here is that um, it's got to meet the, the three requirements. Uh, must Surviving corporation must hold substantially all of the properties of both the surviving and the merged corporation. Well, in this case, uh, in the acquisition subsidiary, usually all, all they're holding, I mean, it's usually going to be a, like a brand new, a newly formed corporation and all they're doing is holding um, stock of SCR which will be eventually transferred uh, to the shareholder or shareholders of the target company. So it's not a lot of assets involved there. But if there were assets, they would have to end up in substantially all of those assets would have to be uh, end up in the surviving corporation, in this case, WCR. Notice that the target shareholders must transfer and exchange an amount of stock in the target that constitutes control, meaning 80% or more, of the target's stock. So they may still keep some or they may keep none. Kind of depends. And last but not least, like I said, target shareholders must receive uh, voting stock uh, of the parent corporation in return for surrendering uh, stock in the target corporation. So that's what that looks like. All right, type B reorganization, stock for stock. For a reorganization to be qualified as a stock for stock, type B reorganization, the acquiring co corporation must exchange solely stock for stock in the target corporation. If there's one dollar or more of cash or other property involved in the exchange, it doesn't qualify as a type B reorganization. Some other requirements are the acquiring corporation must control the target corporation after the transaction, meaning they must own 80% or more of the target corporation's stock. The acquiring corporation, as, as you would imagine, takes a carryover basis in the target corporation's stock received in the exchange. So, so look here. Um, of course, the assets are going to re remain the same basis, right? But the, the, the stock of the acquiring corporation, or actually the, the target corporation's stock, will have a carryover basis to the acquiring corporation. <laughs> Note that the target shareholders must receive solely voting stock of the acquiring corporation. So this is where that one dollar or more of other property, usually cash, becomes involved. 
if they if they want anything other than stock, it won't qualify as a type B stock for stock reorganization. <laughs> All right. So make sure you look at the examples under each of these types of um, acquisitions or reor reorganizations, if you will, and um, make sure you understand those. And um, it's pretty basic, so I mean, this is not like you can go out and work in M and A's, except maybe as a junior accountant. But you know, they're not going to set you out there doing M and A's just based upon this experience. So, but this gives you some basics. All right. Next, we want to move to liquidation. And so this occurs when a corporation acquires all of its stock from its shareholders in exchange for all of its net assets, after which time the corporation ceases to do business. So usually what happens is the board of directors will, will uh, vote on a uh, motion to liquidate the corporation and assuming that they approve the motion, um, they must, for tax purposes, file a Form 966 uh, with the IRS 30 days after they uh, make that resolution to liquidate the corporation. So there's just some technical things involved there, but no big deal. Well, the tax consequences to the shareholders depends on whether you're, not, you're an individual or a corporation. And then also, if you're a corporation, what your ownership interest is in the uh, so you got a corporate shareholder who owns stock in another corporation that's liquidating, right? So the tax consequences to the non-liquidating corporation corporate shareholder depends on their ownership interest in the liquidating corporation is what that's saying. And so all non-corporate shareholders receiving a liquidating distribution have a fully taxable uh, transaction. The difference being uh, the difference between the amount realized and the basis in their stock is a taxable event, usually a capital event. Could be a loss, by the way. So capital gain or loss based upon the amount realized minus the basis in their stock. Now, what happens if there's a uh, liability that's assumed by a shareholder? Well, that simply reduces the, the uh, um, liability simply reduces the amount of, well, the amount that's realized. Well, what happens if you have a situation where uh, the basis of the property received is um, more than the fair market value of the property received that has the liability attached to it. Well, in that case, like, like we saw before, the uh, fair market value is assumed to be the, uh, the same as the liability. Okay. For corporate shareholders, again, you have to discern whether or not that corporate shareholder owns 80% or more. If they do, this liquidating, well, receiving the assets in the liquidating corporation uh, is a non-taxable event. 
and the tax basis in the property that's transferred carries over to the corporate shareholder. Now, what happens if you're a, a corporate shareholder owning less than 80%? Well, it's strictly a uh, taxable event, uh, just like with non-corporate shareholders. Now note here that so that's that's what happens with the the shareholders. What about the corporation, the liquidating corporation? Well, the liquidating corporation recognizes all gains and certain losses on the taxable trans. Uh, distributions of property to the shareholders. And so the only time the liquidating corporation does not recognize, so they recognize all gains and certain losses, right? They're in the, the top line. And so the liquidating corporation does not recognize loss in the, in the event of the, any of the following happening. If they distribute property to a related party, and the property they transfer to the related party has a basis that's more than the fair market value of the property, they do not recognize loss. Hi. Hi. Give me two seconds. I'm almost through. Okay. Sorry. Um, if the distribution is non pro rata, in other words, a certain property goes to one and it's in, let's say, 51% of a certain amount of property goes to a 25% shareholder, uh, that's non pro rata because they should be receiving 25% of that property. So that's a non pro rata. If it's lost property, the liquidating corporation is not going to recognize the loss because it's a non pro rata distribution. And if the asset distributed is a disqualified property, it's not going to be, they're not going to recognize loss. Well, what is a disqualified property? It's property, lost property that's been uh, given to the corporation, the liquidating corporation five years before the liquidation, within that five-year window before the liquidation. Um, so, you know, it kind of looks like um, there's some planning going on, contributing uh, lost property so that you can get the property back and take the loss. Um, they're not going to allow that. Last but not least, there's also a um, tax avoidance purpose. Uh, if they determined that, that property uh, was contributed in order to take a loss, kind of like this five-year deal, um, they're not going to allow it either. Well, uh, how do they determine what is a tax avoidance purpose? Well, uh, the book says that if it was, uh, if the property was co contributed uh, in a uh, property for stock transaction or as a, a contribution to capital within two years of the liquidation, then um, it will not be allowed. So, no recognized loss to the corporation. And that's it.